Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us at this third um, Facebook Live conversation that we've organised. So today we've got PayPlan and the Trestle Trust talking about debt and food banks um, with a particular um, focus on universal credit. So welcome. So my name is Alison Chisholm. I've worked in Debt Advice since 2004 and I've worked with PayPlan for the last three years. Um, PayPlan is one of the UK's leading free debt advice providers and we've been giving free debt advice for about 30 years now. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Roy Wheel from the Trestle Trust. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, I've got your name wrong, haven't I, Rory Wheel? Um, perhaps you could introduce yourself, maybe get your name right. <laughs> it happens surprisingly often. <laughs> Roy might be my alter ego. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for uh, having me on, Asta. So I'm Rory, I'm uh, the Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Trestle Trust. And the Trussell Trust is an anti-poverty charity who supports a network of 1,200 food bank centres uh, across the UK. In addition to providing emergency food to people in financial hardship, we also do national lobbying, which is what um, the team I work in does. So we work with government, with partners and others to try and affect change to end destitution in the UK and to end the need for food banks too. Thanks very much. So today we're here to highlight the relationship between debt and food banks in the UK and to talk a bit about universal credit and also to try and provide some helpful information to anybody who um, is worried about their food or about their money. Um, we can give them some practical tips along the way as well. But perhaps we could start with a conversation about, we've got some questions that have been sent in to us and some that we prepared. Perhaps we could start with what is a food bank and who is it for? Thanks, Alison. So yeah, so, so food banks exist in different forms across all parts of the UK. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, there are 1,200 food bank centres in the Trussell Trust network. Um, that's not all food banks. There are a lot more independent food banks in addition to that too. Um, food banks in our network generally work on a referral basis. So we work closely with partners in the different local authorities in which they operate, local citizens advice bureaus, for example, housing associations, and indeed debt advice. And when those organisations believe that somebody is at, at acute risk of financial hardship, um, they will refer them to a food bank uh, where our volunteers will support people with a, a three day emergency food parcel uh, to get them over and through that, that initial crisis. We're really keen to make sure that um, food isn't the answer and that people's the root causes of people arriving at food banks are addressed, which is why we'll provide wraparound support. We will refer them into other agencies uh, to make sure that whatever the root cause of why they're ended up at a food bank is being addressed, which is why it's obviously great to be talking today with, with, with PayPlan, because that's an area that you guys have really, really strong expertise in. So while food banks do provide that immediate, immediate response in terms of a food parcel, um, there's a real focus on, on addressing those other causes too. Um, in terms of kind of who, who uses food Food banks. We know that the vast majority of people who use food banks, around 95%, are experiencing destitution. So their uh, weekly income after housing costs for a single person is uh, less than 50 pounds a week in many cases. Um, so you're, you know you're you're talking about um, you know really serious financial hardship. Food banks are there for people who can't afford food, not for people who who just can't access food, which is an important distinction to make uh, since COVID hit, where those two issues have sometimes become blurred. That's great, thank you. So that's that's really constructive. So emergency help when you need it and then help with the underlying causes. That's, that's great. So the, the next question on my, my list is about who can get debt advice. And the answer really is anybody who needs it, anybody who feels that they're in financial difficulty. Um, it's never a wrong thing to do to uh, pick up the phone or uh, make contact with a debt advisor. Um, advisors aren't here to judge. They're here to help solve problems. That's what we like doing. So uh, nothing will happen until you're ready to take advice. Um, we know actually that there's um, eight or nine million people in this country who need debt advice and only about two million people who access it. And we know that that's going to get much bigger because of COVID. So um, people contact us when they're ready. Um, and the first step is just to pick up the phone and have a chat. I've heard lots of clients say they wish they contacted us early. And I've never heard somebody say, I wish I'd waited another three years before I contacted you. So um, come when you're ready. We'll take you as you find you. We'll be kind. We'll be non-judgmental. Um, you're in charge about the decisions, but take advice when, um, when you feel you need it, I would say. Um, so the next question we've had, which you've kind of covered, but I think it's worth asking, um, Rory, is about the link between debt and food bank support. Do you need to be in debt to use a food bank? 
No, you don't need to be in debt to use a food bank. Uh, there are often really, really strong links between people who are experiencing debt and needing to use a food bank. So around three quarters of people are in arrears on at least one bill who are arriving at a food bank. Uh, but that isn't by no means the case for everyone. It's just a more common experience. OK, thank you. So someone's um, asked a question about how important is it to get help quickly? Um, so with regards to debt, one of the challenges that we face in the debt world, I think, is that debt collection activity is sometimes way too fast. Um, so uh, a few years ago, the government gave guidance to local authorities saying that they should only use court as a last resort. And they were talking about council tax debts and um, liability orders in the magistrate's court. But in fact, councils do it very quickly in a lot of places. Uh, one missed bill, one missed reminder, and you can find yourself... Um, with a liability order um, so things can escalate very fast so um, there's no there's no problem about getting in touch early i would say i would say um, do you do you find in um in with the trestle trust there's um issues where people have perhaps been turned to friends and family first and exhausted those and how that fits into your process yeah that that can be quite a common experience so um when we look at research that we've done into uh, the experiences that have led people to arriving at a food bank there's, there's generally sort of three three drivers um, and a lack of informal support networks is is really clearly one of them so um, we identify like the three key factors that often drive people to, to needing to turn to a food bank uh, as being having a, a lack of kind of informal social support networks or having exhausted those networks secondarily the kind of low value of welfare benefits and the challenges with accessing those benefits, um, delays and so on. That's a really important second factor. Um, and then the third factor is kind of adverse life events, which can push people um, into situations of, of immediate financial hardship. And those three things can often combine as well. So yeah, the, the, the social, the other kinds of social support being exhausted is, is, is definitely a really relevant factor in, in thinking about how people could, could be forced to use a food bank. I think we find that this, the same thing in that there's a lot of complicated issues about money in families. And sometimes people come to us when they don't want to turn to their family. Sometimes people come to us because they want to keep things very confidential and that's fine as well. Um, and we, as I said before, we take you as we find you and we work for you in the way you want to be worked with. Um, somebody's asked a question about um, when people get to the point where they feel they can't cope and um, what mental health support there is around the services that we offer is that something you'd like to talk about yeah so i mean i i think again this is an area that we would we would work with our agencies in our local area to address um essentially food banks are run by volunteers so you would never go to a food bank to seek mental health support you would go to a food bank to seek an emergency food parcel but we would there would definitely be referral routes into local mental health services and others uh, but i would suggest looking at the likes of mind and others for for advice on what's available in your area rather than relying on on, on food banks for that um and there was also something else i was going to pick up on the, the, in your in your last question as well about you know kind of social networks and 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 debt and and kind of debts to family and friends and so on um because i know we've we obviously wanted to talk a bit about um the links of universal credit and debt um, and what we've been seeing in food banks in recent years is um actually a, a reduction in the number of people who are indebted to family and friends and an increase in the numbers who are in debt to the department of work and pensions so this has been a really, really significant factor that's changed in the last couple of years, is that whereas previously the most common debtor, the most common sort of lender of people at food banks would actually be just, you know, kind of social networks and family and friends. And actually that we've seen that that fall over time relative to um, the Department of Work and Pensions and debts to government have actually been one of the big things we've seen since COVID here with a big rise in people who are having to repay debts back to government as opposed to private lenders and friends and family. Though those two groups still, you know, feature quite prominently, that's a bit of a sort of new picture for us um, that we're, you know, hoping to try and change. Exactly the same picture at pay plan where public sector creditors are becoming more and more important in the balance of debts that people have. Um, and they're also the creditors that are often most difficult to deal with. Uh, they're often not very flexible about what they will negotiate and sometimes they have extra powers that means that they just take money from people and people can't afford to um, lose that money so they're, they're less likely to 
have an affordability assessment. There's a lot of discussion with government going on about that at the moment. But so although if people find themselves in that trap, although um, they are unfortunately got questions that are more difficult to deal with than some other people, that it's still worth getting advice because there are routes in, there are um, teams at the DWP that help, will help vulnerable people that we can we can contact. So it's all and it's always worth it's always worth um, uh, taking advice, even if you've hit a brick wall yourself when you're dealing with that organisation. I would say. Um, so that that brings us neatly onto the next question, actually, which was about the the rates of universal credit. You mentioned low levels of universal credit being a big driver of debt. Um, so th there's been this temporary twenty pounds uplift on. Um, universal credit um, and that's made a, a big difference but it may not be permanent perhaps you could talk a bit more about that yeah absolutely so um, at the start of the crisis back in March um, ourselves and lots of other organizations in the anti-poverty sector you know we're really seeing a, a big rise in need an immediate rise in needs that occurs um, around the start of lockdown um, and the likes of yeah trussell trusts uh, Citizens Advice Bureau, Joseph Roundtree Foundation and many others were kind of calling for not just the jobs retention scheme, as important as that was, but real significant changes to the social security system, because we've known for too long the value of benefits has often unfortunately been been too low. And when people face deductions and debts, they're just pulled pulled under and having to turn to a food bank as a result. So. It was really welcome that at the very start of the crisis, we did see that £20 uplift in universal credit. Um, we also saw an increase in local housing allowance. So people, uh, people's housing benefit has gone a bit further to covering the real cost of renting. Both really welcome things. But as you say, Alistair, um, temporary. And the £20 uplift to universal credit is set to be removed in spring next year. Um, we're of the view that um, there's that, that would take a lot of money uh, away from people uh, who are still going through a really, really difficult time. We think that that £20 uplift should be made permanent. And also, crucially, we think it should be extended to cover legacy benefits as well. So the likes of employment and support and that employment support allowance and old job seekers allowance. People on those benefits haven't benefited from that £20 uplift. Um, so there's a kind of basic fairness argument that we should extend that to all those groups. Um, there's also, you know, clear evidence that this has a, raising those benefits has a clearly positive impact in reducing food bank use. So some of the research we've done has suggested that if that £20 uplift had been introduced in normal times, we may have seen a 30% reduction in food bank use. Um, and the only reason we're not seeing that significant reduction now is because obviously the economic pressures are so much greater so you know the message is really clear that there's the right thing to do if it had been done earlier we'd have actually it would have been a really powerful way of reducing the number of people needing to turn to food banks by getting more money in their pockets um and that's why we really think that this is something that can and should be made permanent alongside uh, extending it to cover legacy benefits as well um it's a really really important way of just get, making sure people have enough to afford essentials um and a, you know a weekly increase in the standard allowance from i believe it's about 77 pounds to 97 pounds a week that's really actually kind of you know really significant um starting from quite a low base but it's still quite significant so it's really important we hold on to that vital lifeline and it doesn't get taken away next spring Brilliant point, really well made. And certainly um, we'd like to be involved in campaigning around that with you um, in the future. Um, and if anybody doesn't agree with you, what I suggest they do is go and visit their local food bank and talk to the people who are coming in hungry and then see what they think about £20 a week. Um, a kind of slightly tangential point. So one of the things that this, this government, um, going back to the coalition really, has done quite well, I think, is that they've been quite good at imposing regulations about treating people fairly on a lot of other organizations so they created the financial conduct authority that has lots and lots of processes about treating customers fairly and collecting debt more fairly but they don't apply those processes to themselves um, so just you might have seen uh, in september the fca is about to ban insurance companies from offering a better deal to new customers as compared to old customers they should apply the same approach to the benefit system. So people have been on benefits for a long time. Um, the benefit system is basically an insurance scheme where we all put money in in order to mitigate risk so that we're looked after when we need it. People who have been on benefits for a long time are more likely to have um, a, the need for a new pair of glasses, new shoes, new coat, new, new furniture, that kind of thing. And um, 
the the idea that we ought to be paying them less i think is just just wrong uh, and i think that what i want to see from this government is applying to themselves more of the processes that they ask other people to use when they're when they're thinking about treating people in difficulties more fairly um, yeah, I, really agree. I, I think it links back to what we were talking about earlier with um the issues of deductions and debts as well which is that obviously in in the private sector there's a there's a need to carry out an affordability assessment before giving someone a loan uh, unfortunately when it comes to government debt when it comes to for example the uh, advanced payments to cover the five-week wait uh, for a first universal credit payment um there's no there's no such affordability assessment so you're right it's a really i think powerful point in saying at the very least we should expect government to um at least have its debt collection and its other policies al aligned with what is expected in the private sector i think that's quite a powerful message that um is quite simple and kind of quite hard to argue against to be honest and the, the, the key with affordability is is so a government um debt collection often looks at income so they, they, they've got systems where they can take money out of wages or benefits, and they do do it as a percentage based on income. But income is only half the story. How many children have you got? How much, what is your housing cost? What transport do you have to pay to get to work? If you get that wrong, taking too much money from somebody is devastating. And being able to differentiate between debt collection to solve a problem so that the needs of the debt collector and the debt are taken into account versus debt collection as punishment is the step that the government needs to take. Really. They need to stop treating debtors as naughty and work with them to resolve their problems, I think. Um, um, somebody's asked about, about um, how they can work out what they're entitled to because the benefit system can be quite complicated. And if you're new to it, as literally millions of people are now new to the benefit system, it's quite tricky. Have you got anything you'd like to say about that? I think that um, there are organisations that like benefits calculators that exist, for example, so turn to us, um, have a really useful kind of benefits calculator to work out what you're entitled to, um, and they'd probably be the best place to, to provide that information, and I believe you can access that on their website, as well as getting in touch with them directly. Yeah, that's true. There's a benefits calculator on our website. If you're, if you're new to Universal Credit, um, the DWP funds a service through Citizens Advice, called help to claim so you can contact them and they can help with the with the early stages of your claim um there's always there is always some help there and i think that's an important message um have we got any questions coming through on the on the live feed um tom can you send it to me on the chat if you have some more um i think we we had through in advance wasn't there about um you know kind of just a little bit about what what we've seen happening since since the pandemic started um, and I'm kind of, yeah, very happy to sort of share a bit of the perspective from the Trussell Trust around what we've seen on the ground. Um, so obviously, as people will be aware that there's been a really significant economic impact since uh, since the pandemic hit in March. And what we saw at the Trussell Trust was a, a media uh, significant rise in use of food banks to really quite unprecedented levels. So back in April, uh, we recorded an 89% increase in the number of people who were accessing food banks compared to the year before. And obviously that comes on top of year on year rises in food bank use over the last decade. So that 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 really significant rise back in April, um, unfortunately has been sustained. So we have continued to see record levels of food bank use throughout the rest of the year uh, and over the summer too. Um, and I think that that's, um, that, that, that's actually, you know, really set to be, continue to be concerning over the coming months. So we've done a piece of work forecasting what that will look like over the winter and based on some economic analysis done by a university we've partnered with, we are forecasting a 61% increase in food bank use compared to last year over the winter too. Um, and there are some kind of underneath those headline figures, there are some sort of different changes in the in the kinds of people who are arriving at food banks. So a lot of people are arriving for the first time. You mentioned Alistair about uh, lots of people claiming universal credit for the first time. We're equally seeing lots of people, around half of all those who arrived in the summer, were using food banks for the first time. That's a much higher figure than we would usually expect, um, which suggests that this is an experience which is unfortunately becoming a lot more common. We're also seeing a disproportionate impact on families and children. Um, so uh, 
previously um, the, the proportion of families would have been slightly lower than the national average, uh, but that's really started to change, um, which again suggests that much more is needed to support children and to support families through the, through the economic crisis too. Um, and that's where things like the £20 uplift to universal credit has been really welcome, but there hasn't been an equivalent rise in the child component of universal credit, for example. Um, and that they're the kind of policies that we would be hoping to see over the coming months too. Um, so we are, we, it really is it's a good time to have this conversation. It does feel like we are at a crossroads a little bit with some of this stuff um, because you know there have been good policy measures um, and uh, they've been really welcome and had a really good impact, uh, but lots of them are only temporary, like the twenty pound uplift, like the jobs retention scheme. So there's actually you know a whole package of measures we think um, can be implemented now that would have a positive impact on debt and reducing debt and also in reducing the need for food banks too. Um, and that's where our kind of priorities are at the moment as we gear up for the winter. We wanna make sure that the things that we're forecasting don't happen. And a really clear message for us is both on a national level, it doesn't need to be this way. There are policies that can make an impact. We can kind of turn this around. And then also on an individual level, like you've said, Alistair, like there are ways of getting support and resolving these problems um, through access to advice that PayPlan and others offer and if need be to access a food bank as well. So being aware of those options at a personal level is important. And then also that kind of national policy change is, is, is really going to be key if we're to avoid these kind of numbers and experiences um, over the winter months. Um, well, I think we can be optimistic that it's easier to get a policy change than it perhaps was five years ago in the welfare system. Yeah. I mean, I think the Tressel plus insight and evidence will be very important in that kind of evidence-based policy is what we need when times change, isn't it? Um, in, in the debt world, I think we've seen a slightly different pattern. So at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a massive increase in demand, but very quickly, um, a lot of uh, organisations collecting debt kind of called off the dogs because of the pandemic. So um, enforcement action stopped and very positive measures were put in place. Um, giving more people access to clubs tax support, giving people three month payment holidays on their mortgages and on their loans. As those come to an end, we're expecting um, the market for debt advice to increase significantly. The, um, the public body, the Money and Pension Service, which is actually part of the DWP and funds uh, debt advice, is, uh, has been providing more funding and gearing up for more help. And um, I know that um, I was talking to one bank recently and they're doubling the number of their staff involved in debt collection. So we know that more and more people are going to be falling into financial difficulty and we're working very hard to make sure that we're ready with as many people as we can um, to provide yeah. help. It's interesting that you're know, talking about the um, the changes that have been made to, to, to private practice as well, because you know there are there are other things we saw in, in, in the first phase of the crisis. So for example, deductions from universal credit. So people needing to kind of repay to the WP, uh, perhaps a benefit overpayment, uh, for example, lots of those debts were suspended for the crisis. Um, and actually when about a quarter of people on universal credit are having to repay debts to the EWP. So that's actually was a really significant measure. Uh, and again, that has since been removed. And as we enter the second phase, lots of those protections and mitigations aren't there in the same way. So I think there's a piece of work to do to well, for us as organisations to look at, well, what impact did that have? What benefit did that have on people? Because as you say, for the first time, we have started to see some improvements. Unfortunately, it's taken a, a pandemic, which isn't the ideal circumstance for lots of this stuff. Um, but it does... Um, it does, it does show a, a shift in direction of travel. And I think it's a great time to sort of, yeah, influence, to become a campaigner, to write to your MP, to put pressure on government, because we've seen, you know, really unprecedented measures, large amounts of money being spent on tackling, um, you know, economic impact. Not every penny has been well spent and there have been uh, real groups that have been left out and missed out. But at the very least, it does show that there's a lot more interest from government in having to basically intervene and provide social safety nets and provision than there might have been a few years ago. So again, these conversations are, are really relevant and, and I think there's going to be an awful lot more policy change that's going to happen over the next few months. There's, there's one uh, bit of work that we're, we're just preparing really around universal credit, one reform that we would like to see, and that's around support for people who are on universal credit and have a mortgage. Uh, so if you, if you have a mortgage at the moment, the benefit system will provide you with a secured loan to cover the interest 
um, and then if you're able to repay it later, there are arrangements for that. But there are two particular difficulties with that, and one is it doesn't kick in for nine months, um, so that's that's too long, really. The, the uh, waiting period after the banking crash in 2008 for the mortgage support system then was reduced to 13 weeks. Uh, that's a measure that can be done really quickly, um, and um, it's a really useful way of uh, keeping people in their houses when they're in mortgage difficulty and avoiding unnecessary debt. The other problem with that system is that if you do any work at all, you lose your mortgage support that month and the clock is reset for nine months. That's really at odds with uh, values that underpin universal credit about making work pay. So, um, so that we want to add that to the list of things that the government could quite easily change. There aren't enormous numbers of people on support for mortgages. It's not enormously expensive. And the cost of uh, people being made homeless to them, to local authorities, to the housing market is very significant. So another one for them. Definitely. And, and, and just on that example of, of, you know, kind of positive measures that once you improve your income slightly or you go into work, you lose. Free school meals is another example of that. And it's something that... Um, that's kind of relevant to today as Marcus Rashford has kind of launched the next phase of his campaign, which has been, a, I think, a really significant factor in drawing attention to lots of these issues. But that's another area where on free school meals, um, entitlements don't exist for everyone on universal credit, um, just uh, just just the group who are kind of worst off. And that um, that's another thing that acts as a, it, it kind of acts as a bit of a disincentive in a way, which is odd because universal credit is designed to encourage people into work. So actually we need to think about kind of extending those benefits to slightly wider groups uh, to encourage that transition too. Absolutely. Yeah, lots of overlaps there. We've, we've got a question from somebody who says that um, they've been supporting friends and family who need support during these times with debts and having no money and sometimes to fill their cupboards with food. Um, I may be someone who can't afford to help them personally. So how can I help that person and direct them to the best place for what they can do. It's, that's a dilemma, isn't it? When you're, you're providing support for people, um, when do you step in and how do you help? What would you say to them? For me, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a really tough one. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's something really valuable in, for example, to take, taking a food bank. It's about the kind of community response and it's about supporting someone emotionally and sort of treating them with dignity. And that's where that kind of, you, you can't underestimate the value of friends and family in helping people through those situations. There are the clear routes by which you can signpost people to advice and support. So if it's a debt problem, you know, get in touch with PayPal, for example, if someone's facing, you know, really immediate financial hardship, then you can look up on the Trussell Trust uh, or the independent food aid network websites where you can kind of find your nearest food bank if that's something that is that is necessary and, and appropriate. And Citizens Advice Bureau are obviously a, a really good go-to for those kind of issues as well. Um, so there are community groups there, there are debt advice, there are other kinds of advice, but it's obviously important not to minimise uh, providing kind of emotional support to people because that will be so much more valuable than someone they don't know just on the end of a phone who has a really important role to play but actually you know friends and family and making sure that people don't feel you know don't feel stigmatized don't feel kind of marginalized and pushed aside but are kind of worked with and supported to engage with those services um because it can be a really difficult thing for people to go and go and get that support and particularly you know from a food bank perspective you know we've spoken to lots of people who it was kind of the last place that they, they wanted or, or felt able to go for sort of very understandable reasons so sometimes having emotional support for people to be able to access those kinds of support is is, is just as key as the kind of financial or food-based support themselves um but yeah it's, it's, it's a really tricky one was there anything from a kind of debt angle that you think well i just say to that person who's providing support to their their friends good for you and you know it's not your job to solve all the problems of society although you really want to help your friends and i think it's great that they know that they've got people um on their on their side one of the kind of weird positives i suppose that we've noticed during the covid crisis is that so people are very often very ashamed of debt even though it's a general society problem um um, a societal problem. People people um, see it as a kind of personal defect if they get into financial difficulty. But because um, COVID is so well known as a cause of debt problems, um, some people are feeling less shamed and more um, sometimes maybe willing to seek help a bit earlier. I think that's very positive. Um, seeking help from friends or family isn't 
isn't um, isn't giving up or being weak. Actually, it's the strong thing to do, and it's the thing it's the thing to do to get some control of the situation where the world is taking control away from you. Um, and the other thing is that I've seen so many clients who never thought they were going to be in that situation. Um, so these things can happen to anybody. Actually, you only need often two or three things to go wrong. Uh, everybody needs some help sometimes. So um, being there for people is one of the best things you can do. And also speaking up about it, um, making it normal. Um, everybody, everybody needs um, everybody needs food and the reason that organisations like the Trestle Trust provide it is because they want you to have it <laughs> and they want to solve the underlying problem. So, you know, go in with your head held high and they'll treat you well. I do what I do wonder if, um, you know, one of the, I suppose, one of the perhaps few hopes from the whole situation this year is that it creates a bit more sort of, I guess, social fellow feeling and solidarity and bringing people basically feeling like they're not, marginalized but are experiencing something an awful lot of people are and you only have to look at the number of people who are who are furloughed who have to turn to government support who might never have expected to do that before there was a point where uh, uh, over half the country was having their wages paid for by the government and it's things like that where you go well this could be a bit of a moment sort of change attitudes because like you say like stigma and the shame that exists around things are, are definitely real issues and they're real barriers to people getting support as well so we've got to I think um, the more we can do like you say to sort of normalize to to kind of share experiences um, I think the more we can stop this being a marginal problem and then the more people kind of get support when they need it um you know that if i'm being if i'm being I'm trying to find something optimistic in the, in the current circumstances that that could be one of the few areas where we could see some progress in sort of attitudes um yeah hopefully so that there is lots of help there and we're working together to make positive change i think that's probably a good point to finish on i think we've answered all our questions so thanks very much today i found it a very interesting discussion um and i hope there's more that we can do together in the future and thanks to everybody who listened in any, thanks, any final any final remarks no no just um you know as i said at the start um the next few months are going to be really important if we're to try and get the government to make some of the changes we've talked about so things like the 20 pound increase to universal credit um there's lots of campaigns going on. If you can, you can sign up to be a Trust or Trust campaigner and you can sign up to other organisations like Joseph Roundtree Foundation and others who are, who are kind of pushing on this issue too. So if you want to kind of get involved and change some of that stuff, then uh, there are places that you can do that because the next few months will, will be really key. So that's, a, that's an important aspect to bear in mind too. Great. Okay. Thanks very much then. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. See you next time. Bye. Bye.